pardon the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre. It is great to be back on the show with a true mentor. Tony Kornheiser, are you calling me old? That's what that sounds like, that I'm old. No, no, I'm not calling you that. Maybe uh, the physics of light are suggesting such a quality. I personally would never, would never indicate that myself. No, I leave that to, to others. Like Good, good. Because let me explain to people out there, I am old. It's okay. I'm old. Welcome to PTI, <laughs> boys and girls. Wilbon has one last day off. So here again is the chief investigator of the Pablo Torre Finds Out broadcast, Mr. Pablo Torre. A little late on that applause, kids. A little late. And we begin today with Victor Wembanyama, who outdueled fellow rookie Chet Holmgren last night as San Antonio got a rare win beating Oklahoma City. Holmgren had 23 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 1 block, which is good. Wembanyama had 28 points, 13 rebounds, 7 assists, and 5 blocks, including one doozy on Holmgren, which is better. Plus, Wembanyama made 5-3. So, Pablo, did last night's win feel like a one-off for the lowly Spurs or a glimpse into the future? It felt like the future, Tony. And I want to talk about the Holmgren of this because I'll use an old reference, uh, sort of appropriate, I suppose, for the way you started the show. Victor Wembanyama is Mozart. Chet Holmgren is Salieri. Chet Holmgren is amazing, right? He can block, he can pass, he can shoot threes, he can do all the things that Wembanyama does, except he has the misfortune of existing at the same time as the guy who is just better. And so that block that you just saw, the block of Wembanyama on Holmgren, it felt like a statement, a statement that the Spurs put their whole future into. This guy, Wembanyama, you've seen aliens allegedly before. You haven't seen a guy like our guy. And I believe that he's yeah. for real. Yeah. By the way, that's a great movie reference. That, that is a great movie with Mozart and Sally. That, that's got to yes. be 25, 30 years old. It's a great movie. Okay. So when you look at Wembanyama and Holmgren on the court, when you look at all the big guys in the NBA on the court, you get a distorted sense of reality. You don't realize how big they really are because they're surrounded by people approximating their own size. Holmgren is 7'1", his wingspan is 7'6". Wembanyama is 7'4", with an 8-foot wingspan. They're not players, <laughs> they're condors out there. And the statistics that they pile up, given their age and their height, are amazing to me. Honestly, their coordination is incomprehensible to me. It really is. Yes, it, it's certainly Dang. a glimpse into the future, Wembenyama came into the league with more advanced hype than anyone since LeBron, more than Zion Williamson. And Pablo, every game he plays, he's measured against an impossible standard. He's measured essentially against Will Chamberlain all the time. But he's gotten clearly better this year as month goes into month into month. He leads, he's a rookie, he leads the league in blocks. In the month of February, he shot 41% from three. The only thing yes. you worry about, honestly, is his stamina. And he played the entire fourth quarter last night for the first time all year. Yeah, the biggest knock on him when he entered the league was his three-point shooting percentage early on. It was not good. And people thought, okay, maybe that's the one part of his game that doesn't translate. How could this guy physically built that way, like a structural engineering problem? How could he possibly shoot 40% from three? And now he's doing it. Right. And this is the yeah. thing, Tony. Like, you know, I, I watched Joel Embiid before he got hurt, and I was saying to myself, Joel Embiid is what everybody hopes Victor Wembanyama will become one day. He can do it all. But I watch Wembanyama in the months since Embiid got hurt, and I'm thinking to myself, actually, he's sui generis. Actually, this Mozart comparison works because there are rivals, and they are real rivals. Holmgren might be the all-star, the, sorry, the rookie of the year, an all-star himself, if not for Wembanyama, but Wembanyama is here. And I've just never seen anything exactly like him in that way. But here in New York, Tony, the Warriors topped the team of your youth and mine because Steph Curry had 31, Jonathan Kaminga added 25, the Dubs beat the Knicks by 11, the Warriors are rising, they've now won 10 of 12, the falling Knicks have lost 7 and 9. And so the headline here, is it the Warriors winning again or the Knicks losing again? It's the Warriors winning again, and here we go on this show with the Warriors again. One day it's the Warriors and the Lakers, the next day it's the Lakers and the Warriors. And I'm sure later in the show we are going to get to the Lakers. But it's the Warriors winning again because they are a much more glamorous team. 
than the New York Knicks. They are a much more accomplished team than the New York Knicks. And their recent fall is much more interesting than the New York Knicks because the Knicks haven't risen to any level where their fall actually means anything. I mean, it doesn't. The Warriors have won 10 out of 12, did you say? I think 12 out of 15. More importantly to me, they've won seven straight on the road, which is where you make hay in the NBA. Last year, they were terrible on the road. They were 11 and 30. It was the fourth yep. worst record in the NBA on the road. So if you are Adam Silver praying for the Warriors and Lakers to win, then last night was a very good night. <laughs> and the thing about the Warriors that makes it all very simple, right? It's the fact that Steph Curry at the end is going to hit some threes. Steph Curry still has the ability to do that. I watched this entire thing. Steph Curry, there's a deus ex machina aspect to him. He pops up at the end, says, you're waiting for God to show up. Here he is. Now, the wrinkle to this Warriors team is Klay Thompson goes to the bench and is not, you know, Tony, I watch Klay Thompson not be himself anymore. And you watch him think, you watch him make decisions. It's uncomfortable for me to watch him. The good news for the Warriors, though, is that Jonathan Kaminga is He's a young player who looks like he might just be a star. And I don't say that lightly. I watch him slither to the hoop. I watch his athleticism. I watch his ability right. to do lots right. of things at that position as a tall guard, a tall forward, really, a swing man. And I'm like, okay, that guy's going to help this team if they make a deep run as Adam Silver has dreamed. But for the Knicks, Tony, they don't have Julius Randle. And now I'm wondering, okay, maybe this city needs to appreciate Julius Randle more than we did before he got hurt. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of it. I've been told anecdotally that nobody appreciates Randall the way they should. Randall is out, Ananobi is out. These are two pretty big guys, and they're starters. And the Knicks are 6-8 and eight without them. You know, now the Knicks can shoot from the outside, right? Brunson can shoot, and DiVincenzo can shoot, and Bogdanovich can shoot, Hart can shoot. It's hard to win that way without bigs, whereas the other team's healthy. You know, Chris Paul is back, and I, I dare say that Draymond Green hasn't been suspended in like 21 hours by now. We turn now to the NFL Combine and the quarterbacks at the top of the ladder, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May. They all spoke today. Pablo, you saw the clips. I saw the clips. Do you have any particular takeaway? Yeah, these guys aren't seeing the Combine as an audition. They're seeing it as a checkpoint along the way to a place that they are confident they're going to go. So when Caleb Williams says, I'm not doing medical testing, all of these things that you make people do, lots of prospects, by the way, Tony, now, are they're opting out of the quote-unquote intelligent testing, the cognitive testing, the S2 test that's been in vogue. They're saying, no thanks, don't need to do that in numbers that we haven't seen before. Because these guys are confident about their market value. And it's a reflection of the way in which information travels, and maybe, just maybe, a crazy thought has finally sunk in. The tape of these guys playing football is actually the most important part of the entire quote unquote addition that the combine's supposed to be. Yeah, so I have a vested interest in Caleb Williams because he's local for me. He went, as Wilbon says all the time, to Gonzaga High School, where Wilbon's son, Matty, or as we lovingly call him, Lilbon, goes to school. <laughs> and and I've, been, I've been paying attention to what Williams has said over the last few weeks. And he's been Mr. Sunshine. He said, I'd be honored and thrilled to play in Chicago and be really cool if I played in Washington my hometown. He doesn't have to go beyond one and two because he's not going to slip to three. He doesn't have to no. say something nice about New England. He doesn't even have to know what state New England plays its games in. He doesn't have to know that. He was also, he, I think one of the things he said, someone asked him, he's a very confident young man. And as you say, he says, Let's just look at the tape. You know, I don't have to throw for you. Just look at the tape. And by the way, buzz off. I've got the Dr. Pepper national commercial. But when he was asked where he wanted to go, he said, essentially, it doesn't matter as long as I'm the first pick. He wants the first pick, and he wants everything that comes with it. And I think he knows the good and the bad that comes with it. I watched Drake May say, I'll go anywhere, which is probably what you're supposed to say. And when he was asked, what can you bring to a club? And he says, I can do it all. So that's settled. He's going to be great. He can do it all. I was sure. concerned. I watched Jaden Daniels being interviewed on the NFL Network for a while. It got a little technical for me. I, I got off it after a while. But I couldn't take my eyes off him because I wanted to know, is he big enough? I know he's tall enough. Is he big enough? Is he thick enough? And this, of course, the echo of this is between Stroud and Bryce Young, right? I mean, because one guy is bigger and thicker and had a great year. Yes. And the number one pick overall is slighter and smaller and did not. And so I was looking at him. And th those, you know, that was my sense of all the quarterbacks. That was it. Yeah, and then by Let's the way, you throw it. Yeah, yeah.
just throw in at the very end, Tony, the knowledge that none of us know anything about any of these guys. The NFL every year, sophisticated tests, metrics, let's see, evaluate their physiques, and inevitably, Brock Purdy ends up being the guy playing in a Super Bowl. So just a brief reminder at the end. No, that's right. And 50% of, of, of the one pick and the two pick, 50% always fails. Always fails. Yeah. You don't know which one yep. is going to work. Let's take a break. Coming up, the NFL is considering doing away with the first down chain gangs. What is the word for that? And how best to describe the job that new Pac-12 commissioner Teresa Gould is facing. By the way, I know what you're saying about Wembenyama. If you give me home grin, I'm happy. You know, they block shots, they rebound. If they want to go shoot threes, okay, it's a new world. But they block oh, shots and rebound. Great. It's time to marvel at Pablo's Ivy League vocabulary and what's the word? What's first? Losing the NFL chain gangs would be blank. It would be progress. Look, I don't like to put people out of work. I've enjoyed watching the chain gang lumber down the sidelines for a lot of years. But honestly, if you can get a more accurate spot for the ball, you have to try and do that. The chain gang has nothing to do with it. They're just pawns in the game. What's wrong with it the way it is now? What's wrong with it is that the referee very often gets the spot wrong. So again, if you have technology, cameras that will pinpoint the exact place to put the ball, I would think even the officials would think that that was good. Look at the pylon cam. Look what that has done. This would be a good thing. This would be progress. This is an out-of-body experience for me, Tony, because my word, I'm going to do something I've never done on this uh, show before in this segment. I'm going to use your word, but just throw some scare quotes around it, because I, too, believe it would be progress. It would just be progress, because the promise of technology, and I cannot believe I'm the one to make this argument to you, the promise of technology is an overpromise, and I've... I've struggled with this because I'm with you, right? Precision instruments exist. Technology can make yeah. accuracy a reality. The issue, though, if you look at every sport, is that this technology just leads to more arguing. So I think of VAR in soccer. I think of the tennis ball cam in tennis. I think of the ways in which ostensibly we know everything within a fraction of a decimal point. But in reality, we still get it wrong. And so for me... If I'm choosing between the entertainment of the chain gang and that one time they took a piece of paper out to put it between the ball and that right. first down marker right. versus a bunch of people stopping every game to huddle around a monitor under the premise of progress, but really it's just more arguing, I kind of like the olden days, which again, very shocking for me to say that out loud to you. By, by the way, I would point out that even if you had the progress that I'm talking about, you'd still have a chain gang. You'd, you'd still have marks on the sidelines so that runners would know where to go. Quarterbacks, if yes. they were trying to Job get first creation. downs, they would know where to go. What's next? New Pac-12 commissioner, Teresa Gould, has a blank job. She has a cushy job. There is no Pac-12. She's the commissioner of a <laughs> non-conference. It doesn't exist. She is sailing on a ghost ship. Right? There's only two <laughs> schools left in it, Washington State and Oregon State. So she doesn't even need an office. She can do all of her business from a kiosk on the border between Washington and Oregon. She got a two-year deal, and the NCAA has already promised that for the next two years at least, the Pac-12 will be treated like a real conference and all the guaranteed money will st still get there. So she won. She's the greatest commissioner in history. <laughs> and now she's just sitting and waiting for the Mountain West teams to funnel in. That's all it is. Cushy. It's, it's an amazing job. It's a hilarious job. But for me, the word I'll use to build on your argument, which is beautiful, the ghost ship, is it's a Montessori style job. So Tony, I have a four year old, I'm contemplating like, where am I gonna send my kid to school? Where's Violet gonna go and learn? And the Montessori approach is, yeah, throw some kids out there, let them figure it out for themselves. I believe that the Pac-12 <laughs> with two kids in this classroom, just like playing with blocks uselessly is kind of what I imagine when I think of that. Now I'm no educational expert, but I think of other schools, fancy, ex fancy prep schools, the sons of executives, the Big Ten, the SEC, these are future capitalists. 
They want to know, how am I going to get my kid into college? The Pac-12 is just like, yeah, let's finger paint. Why not? Are we even a school? Should we be a school? Will we have to merge with some other real that's school great. that's less than our school, but still is like kind of not a school? Yeah, that's how I think of all of it. It's great that you use the Montessori example, because Wilbon, of course, would call that hocus pocus junk. And he would say, no, you have to go to a school where you get hit, where you have to sit yeah, there. And if you even nun, laugh at the wrong time, someone whacks you in the head, because that's what Wilbon went through. So Wilbon would love Days that. Days of yore. That's why Lilbon yeah. did not go to Montessori school. That's my guess. He's better anyway. for it. All right. <laughs> That's the last word. Let's take one last break, but still to come, the Wizards. Descent continues. Of course it does. And Anthony Kim, Tony, has returned to professional golf. And I'm going to tell you something, Pablo. His score was better than I thought it was going to be. Because he was out there, you got to put everything out, you got to make the shots, you're playing with pros, there's money on the line. Happy time, people. Happy 34th birthday tomorrow, Malcolm Butler. Let's go back to the day of February 1st, 2015, Super Bowl 49 in Arizona. Seattle was driving for the winning touchdown down 28 24 to the Patriots. The Seahawks were on the Patriots' one yard line. With 26 seconds to go, it was second down, and the Seahawks had Marshawn Lynch in the backfield, who had just carried the ball four yards to the one on first down. Everybody assumed Russell Wilson would hand the ball to Beast Mode, but offensive coordinator Daryl Bevel outsmarted everyone, including himself. He called a pass. Wilson threw it. Malcolm Butler made the most famous interception in history. Patriots win. It's got to be one of the most stunning endings ever, and Pablo, don't ask me where I was. So everybody keeps talking about this, Tony, all these documentaries. Everybody is remembering this moment because it actually is one of the greatest choke jobs of all time. And I want to know where you were. Where actually were you, Tony? Why are you not telling me where you were? Told you, I told you not to ask me. I'm going to name drop. I was at a fancy party at Jimmy Kimmel's house with our friend oh, Bill Simmons is. and with two Patriot fans. I think Damon and Affleck, something like that. Oh, and they Lord. went crazy when he made that yeah. interception and i felt wow this is pretty cool happy anniversary full Mickey Wilbon. Just this went is posthumous full Wilbon of course but on this i did but on this day 55 years ago the great yankee center fielder retired quote i can't play anymore mantle said plainly and unemotionally i can't hit the ball when i need to i can't steal second when i need to i can't go from first to third when i need to i can't score from second when i need to i have to quit unquote Mantle left behind seven World Series rings, three MVPs, a triple crown in 1956 when he hit, get this, 353 with 52 homers and 130 RBI. He left behind 536 home runs and 1,509 RBI. And Mantle left behind his place in the great New York debate about center fielders. Who was the best, Mantle, Mays, or Snyder, the enduring baseball question of my youth? I was refreshing my understanding of Mickey Mantle today, Tony, and I realized that he is still 12th in career OPS, the great semi-advanced slugging statistic, and the three guys ahead of him, three of them at least, are steroid-era guys. But for me, it's that quote that you just read that I really am hit by, the idea that athletes are really delusional so. all of the time. But to be that clear-eyed about how they are mortal at the end is just incredibly effective. Fabulous quote. Happy trails to the Wizards for the 13th game in a row. I told you we would get to the Lakers. They beat the Wizards last night. The upset was they had to go to overtime to do it. Jordan Poole had a season-high 34 for Washington. Wasn't enough. This was the Wizards' 13th straight loss. Tonight against the Clippers will likely be 14. The Wizards didn't win any games in February. Why will they win in March? The Wizards have plenty of time to catch the Pistons' record losing streak of 28. The Lakers won again after that 21-point fourth-quarter comeback against the Clippers on Wednesday night. 39-year-old LeBron James got 31 points, going 30-plus in a back-to-back. -back. Anthony Davis had 40 and 15, and Adam Silver slept happy. Tony, can I point out one simple thing about the way that history sometimes rhymes? Sometimes the universe smiles upon us. If the Wizards lose 27 in a row, number 28 with the streak on the line would be against the Detroit, Detroit. Pistons which would be unbelievably yeah. fun. Please, We'd please We'd want to see it. that. One error. Yes. Last night was the second time Wimbanyama played the entire fourth quarter. In fact, he's done it the last two games in a row. If we can get to the ah. big finish, that would make me happy.
The NCAA Rules Committee recommended the adoption of the two-minute warning in college football. Is that all right with you? No, I don't want more commercials. But Anthony Kim shot plus six in his first comeback round at the Live Tour stop in Saudi Arabia. Your thoughts? Hadn't played in a real tournament against pros in 12 years. I thought he could have gone 80. Cam Newton apologized for his role in the scuffle at a seven-on-seven youth football tournament. Your reaction? I'm still amazed by the fact that his hat stayed on his head the whole time. Austin Matthews scored his 53rd goal in a win over the Coyotes. Are you impressed? He's still on pace for 73. Hasn't been done in 34 years, I believe. Something like that. Last one. F1 season starts tomorrow. You excited? I got my license when I was 27 years old. Probably the wrong guy to be excited about professional driving of cars. Really? We're out of time. Try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Thank you for watching. Pablo Torre Finds Out is my show. But for now, here's Sports Center. 31 years. Did I say 34? It was 31 years. I'm not very good at math.